Tonight on Talking Politics, Massachusetts legislators took another big step toward legalized sports betting this week, with the state Senate passing its version of a bill nine months after the House passed its own. But there are still plenty of sticking points that could keep a final deal from getting done. We'll get into those in a few minutes. Plus, after reinventing herself as a community activist, Diane Wilkerson appears to be readying another run for the state Senate seat she gave up almost 15 years ago when she was convicted of extortion. But first, a look at two statewide races where money and the way it can shape politics may become a major issue. During a climate forum with the Democratic candidates for governor this week, State Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz called on Attorney General Maura Healey to join her in her pledge to reject all campaign donations tied to the fossil fuel industry. It's a challenge that came less than half a day after Democratic candidate for Attorney General Quentin Palfrey called on his opponents to sign a so-called People's Pledge, rejecting outside special interest spending, an idea that dates back to Elizabeth Warren's Senate contest with Scott Brown. As Politico's Lisa Kaczynski noted, Pelfrey's push seems tailored toward former city council president Andrea Campbell, whose bid for Boston mayor last year was bolstered by $1.6 million in super PAC spending and who just got a high-profile endorsement this week from former Congressman Joe Kennedy. I'm joined now by GBH News City Hall reporter Soraya Wintersmith and Boston Herald reporter Sean Philip Cotter. Thank you both for being here. Soraya, many people may be familiar with Wilkerson's political career and with her conviction. They may not know as much about what she has done over the past few years. How has she been reinventing herself? Yeah, Adam, I think reporting across the media landscape shows that Wilkerson, pretty much since she emerged from reentry, has been visible and active. Former Mayor Menino gave her like a Women Changing the World Award shortly after her reentry, and ever since then she's been visible. Most recently she co-founded Wakanda 2 in an effort to kind of coalesce black voting power behind a black mayoral candidate. We know that was ultimately unsuccessful. She's also been visible and active co-founding the Black Boston COVID-19 Coalition. So people know her and know about her work. Uh, Sean, Philip Martin, my colleague and Soraya's colleague here at, at GBH, interviewed Wilkerson about a year ago. And one of the things that jumped out at me as soon as I read it in his piece and continues to stick with me to this day is her seeming lack of contrition for the actions that led to her conviction. Philip asked if she had any regret when it comes to those actions. And Wilkerson said, I would say yes, but I don't know what I could have done. Like I did not expect the informant to bring cash and I couldn't walk down the street with it in my fist. It was out of caution as opposed to subterfuge, like I didn't even have an envelope. Of course, this conjures up images of that famous photo or uh, screen grab, whatever it was, of Wilkerson stuffing money into her brassiere. Do you think that this will be an issue for her if she does decide to run? It'll definitely be an issue for her. I mean, as you said, that photo is... Uh pretty iconic. It's one of the most recognizable Boston political photos of the past 20 years. Um, and she is entering a field that's very crowded already. Um, she's She'll be facing off, assuming that she does bring back her papers, she actually hasn't restarted right. uh, her campaign committee yet, but she has pulled the papers to get the signatures to run. And assuming that she does run, uh, she would be running against sitting state reps Nika Alugardo and Liz Miranda, uh, who are both very visible in the city, and um, the Reverend Minier Culpepper, who has been around for a long time and is very uh, well-connected politically. And so, I mean, I'm not sure what choice she has other than to just sort of push through and say, well, uh, I'm moving past that if yeah. she does want to run uh, as Soraya mentioned, um, she has been active in the community over the past several years. I mean, the, the Wakanda 2 effort to coalesce behind a black candidate, like that actually goes back to 2018 in the Rachel Rollins race. Right. Uh, so she's been back at it for a while. That's a good point, worth bearing in mind. And Soraya, your reference to Menino giving her that award, which seemed like at the time kind of a, an official, semi-official, welcome back into public life. That's important too. 
Let's talk a little bit about the race for attorney general, which so far hasn't gotten a ton of media attention, certainly not as much as the race for governor. As we mentioned a little bit ago, money is becoming a flashpoint in the Democratic AG's primary. Uh, this week, Quentin Pelfrey said, let's all agree that we should ask super PACs to stay out of the race. Of course, they can't officially coordinate with super PACs, but they can make a public request. Yesterday at this AG's forum uh, for the Democratic candidates at Boston College, Pelfrey brought this up again and reminded people who were in attendance or watching at home that Andrea Campbell was the beneficiary of pro-charter school uh, super PAC activity when she ran for mayor of Boston. Let's take a listen to how Pelfrey framed it and what Campbell said in response. The biggest threat to our democracy is corporate money in our elections. In the 2021 mayor's race, that corporate money flooded into super PACs, supporting and opposing candidates. In Boston in particular, there are charter schools. The majority of those students attending those schools are black kids and black students who have been failed by our traditional public schools and are looking for a choice. Soraya, the past isn't necessarily prologue here, but how did the outside money issue play out in last year's Boston mayoral contest? Campbell being a common thread between this campaign that we're discussing now and the former yep. campaign, the mayoral campaign, is a fun thing to think about. Adam, I think I would describe it most like that scene in Mean Girls where like the second tier mean girl is trying to make a phrase <laughs> popular and the first tier mean girl just shuts her down like Gretchen, it's not going to happen, like stop. There were various calls not to take money from the fossil fuel industry. I think Campbell may have even pledged that she wouldn't take money from um, law enforcement unions. There were calls to not take money from Trump affiliated or Republican affiliated outfits processing the cash. Um, but everybody had a super PAC. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and it didn't hurt Michelle Wu, obviously, who was the beneficiary of some big spending by environmental groups who supported her candidacy. Sean, uh, money in politics also becoming an issue in the Democratic gubernatorial primary. At least Sonia Chang Diaz hopes it will become one. Let's look at what she said to um, uh, Maura Healy at this forum hosted by our friends at WBUR, coordinated by the Environmental League of Massachusetts, and then how Healy responded. I want to invite you as well, Attorney General, to join me in that pledge and return the $50,000 of fossil fuel donations that you have received since your last election so that the voters in Massachusetts can know, you know where our North Star is and where our loyalties lie. I don't think um, the fossil fuel industry likes me too much. ExxonMobil took me to court no less than three times in three different states to try to shut down my investigation. I am not on their holiday card list. Sean, could you see this becoming a fruitful line of attack for Sonia Chang Diaz, who polls show has a ton of ground to make up to make this a competitive race? I mean, these kinds of attempts at creating a new front in the in a political fight often only work if they're pl either playing off of existing narratives or poking holes in yeah. somebody else's existing narratives. And I'm not sure this does that. I mean, going off of Soraya's Mean Girls reference, I mean, this any pledge like this is a little bit of trying to make fetch happen here. <laughs> and um, I mean, like, yeah, think about like if you ran for Senate a few years ago, if you got a donation, you're you're a nice guy. Let's say if you got a donation from like Charles Manson, <laughs> it wouldn't <laughs> say. be like, <laughs> let's say. But you don't have any connection to him. Everybody would say, huh, that's weird. And then they'd move on. But if you had previously been out there saying weird stuff about Helter Skelter and dune buggies and that sort of thing, <laughs> then maybe it would stick. But You know, I was going to say, not to, not to distract us, I was going to say there's no way here that you can top Soraya's reference. Uh, you're coming pretty close. So as you were, please continue your thought. But so, yeah, I mean, this... I'm not sure if this does tie into an, an existing narrative other than the fact that Maura Healy is the incumbent and has a lot of money. Yeah. And not uh, the incumbent. The, it, the establishment has a lot of money. I, I was actually thinking about the way this issue plays out. Now, obviously, money in politics is an appropriate subject of scrutiny. Strong arguments can be made that it warps the political process. But back when it was a big deal for Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown, it was a newer issue then. We were closer to Citizens United and the idea, oh, they're going to keep the bad guys out. It was fresher. 
And now when I hear the phrase people's pledge, I probably shouldn't admit this on air, but I kind of tend to think sometimes, oh, here we go again. Again, not that there aren't appropriate concerns to be raised. All right, uh, Sean, sticking with you for a second, you wrote in a piece for the Herald this week that had one of the best leads I've read in a while, that the Great North End dining fight of 2022 may be ending not with a bang, but with a whimper. What is going on exactly? Um, well, it appears that, I'm not sure that was actually my lead. That might've been somebody else's. Oh no. But, oh no. Did I go, well, okay. In a, in a piece <laughs> with a great lead. And I, yeah. that's, I, I like the collegial high mindedness. So in a piece that had one of the best leads I'd ever uh, read, at least this year, there was a reference to Godfather shouts, you know, it's not business, it's personal, or it's not personal, it's business. Anyway, what's going on in the North End? Well, uh, the, now 67 North End restaurants have indeed applied to have outdoor dining through the city program this year. That's compared to 77 last year. So it's pretty close even after the whole kerfuffle of the past few months over the more stringent North End dining rules and the fee for the neighborhood. Um, there was a lot of, there were dueling press conferences. There was a lot of back and forth between some of the restaurateurs and the Wu administration. But ultimately, there wasn't, the, the lawsuit that was vowed did not materialize. Yeah. Um, we do have a North End restaurateur who's going to be apparently running in a sticker campaign for the special election for uh, District 1. Uh he was one of the more frustrated people, uh, George Mendoza. But um, who, who? But most people there are multiple body. images of him looking very displeased and vocally expressing his displeasure with the mayor, right? Oh so yeah, yeah. He was one really of the people catch. who was leading some of those anti Wu press conferences at the time. But um, after all this, uh, most places did buy in um, ahead of the May one start date. Uh, 28 sought uh, hardship exemptions, and 23 of those were granted. Mm -hmm. And so this might be the end of it. Might be the end of it. Well, it'll be interesting to see, because this followed the uh, protests and overlapped to some extent with the protests at the mayor's home. Be interesting to see if there's another flashpoint that pops up in the next few months, or maybe if things settle down a bit for Mayor Wu. Soraya, yes. finally, question for you about the Boston City Council, which has been grappling with this issue a lot of elected bodies across Massachusetts are wrestling with right now. Namely, do we maintain the remote access to the political process that was created in the first couple of years of the pandemic? Or as life slowly gets back to normal, even though the pandemic's not gone entirely, do we maybe pull back on that? Where does the City Council now stand with that question? I'll just say uh, first shout out to you and discussing this issue in your show oh, and thanks. having one of the transparency advocates that's now calling for the city council to keep open its working sessions. Those are the meetings where um, industry folks and administration officials and electeds typically iron out like the kinks of legislation and transparency advocates are saying it should happen in full view of the public and be live streamed. Liz Breeden, the Alston Brighton counselor, has now introduced a piece of legislation that right now would mandate the council and like 18 other boards and committees in the city um, live stream their proceedings. And what's your sense? I know it's early yet. Is that likely to happen or is it TBD? It's TBD. Breeden has said that once it goes through process, they'll price out all of the equipment it would take to outfit the various rooms with the appropriate, you know, stuff that you need to live stream. Um, and I think she only has one co-sponsor on hmm. that piece right now, but we got to let it move and see. Um, this is or could be a point of tension because the council president, prior to introducing this piece of legislation, just sent a memo to the staff and said, we are going to revert back to how it was prior to the pandemic. And so we got to watch and see if Britain can get more folks on with her view or if they'll just um, defer to the council president. All right, Soraya Wintersmith, Sean Philip Cotter, thanks. Next up, four years ago, the Supreme Court gave states the right to make gambling on sports legal. Since then, more than 30 states have taken that step, including New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, 
and New York. Here in Massachusetts, sports betting still isn't legal, but this week the state Senate passed a bill that would change that. But before you start checking the latest odds from Vegas, be forewarned, although the state House passed a bill too, and Governor Charlie Baker has said he's on board with the idea, the House and Senate are very much not on the same page when it comes to how this new industry should operate, and there is no guarantee they'll be able to work out their differences. Joining me to talk about the odds of sports betting becoming a reality here are Shira Schoenberg, reporter at Commonwealth Magazine who's been covering this issue for years, and Father Richard McGowan, an associate professor of finance at Boston College's Carroll School of Management. Thank you both for stopping by. Shira, the Senate passed their sports betting bill in a voice vote. Is that significant as we ponder what might happen next? That is incredibly unusual. In many years of covering the legislature, I can't remember another time that I've seen the Senate vote on a really significant policy matter by voice vote instead of by roll call. And first of all, it's opaque because we don't know how individual senators feel about sports betting. Uh, more than that, I think it's very significant. Um, it means there are clearly multiple senators that don't want to take a public position. It could be because they're at odds with their constituents. It could be because they want the freedom to potentially vote against a bill when it comes out of conference committee without being accused of flip-flopping. And I thought it was really interesting to hear Senate President Spilka say when asked yesterday, it doesn't matter whether I support sports betting, it matters whether the Senate supports it. So we still don't know where the Senate president stands on this issue. Even by the standards of the State House, that's a fascinating amount of opacity. Father mm -hmm. McGowan, uh, these are two big pieces of legislation, the Senate bill that just passed, the House bill that passed unanimously, I shouldn't say unanimously, almost unanimously uh, last year. To your mind, as someone who watches this stuff closely, what are the big similarities, if there are any, and what are the big differences? Well, the similarities is they allow some kind of legalized sports gambling. That's about it. After that, it really goes down. I think what you're seeing here is... Uh, I think it was really and it's what Shira was talking about, how gambling, no one's ever for gambling. Everyone, everybody likes the idea of the revenue that comes from gambling. So notice the House bill certainly would be a, a much bigger revenue producer. The Senate bill is much more worried about the gambling problems and the, pro, and the problem, get problem gambling will be associated with sports gambling. So it, they're, they have very different aims, really, and that, that's one of the, that's, that's why it will be very interesting to see how they would overcome these differences. You mentioned the revenue discrepancy. If I remember correctly, the House says that their legislation, if passed, would end up bringing in about $60 million a year annually. The, uh, the Senate puts their projection at about half that. Shira, what are some other discrepancies between these two plans that people should be thinking about? I think the really big one is whether they allow betting on college sports. The House would allow betting on college games, like the NCAA tournament. The Senate does not. And Speaker Mariano has actually said that's really a deal breaker because why do it if you don't allow betting on college games, which are just so incredibly popular to bet on. Uh, so I see that as the biggest thing. Obviously, Father McGowan mentioned the tax rates. There are some differences in you know, when sports betting companies can run ads, but I see the college betting one as really the biggest distinction between the two. Father McGowan, you and I talked earlier this week in advance of the, the Senate debate on this legislation, and I remember you voiced some pretty sharp skepticism of the House Speaker's idea that this just wouldn't be worth doing if you didn't include college sports. Why do you find that argument suspect? Because... Boston is a pro sports town. It is not a college sports town. You do not see, for instance, you will never hear college college scores put on on TV and radio. It's a, it, well, they bet on the Patriots, well, they bet on the Red Sox, the Bruins, and the Celtics most definitely, especially as these teams are doing very well. I think it's a red herring. The whole thing about college sports. I mean, I, I will grant you that I think during uh, March Madness there would be if. We were in Alabama and Georgia and Tennessee. It would make a huge difference because they follow the SEC. But 
name what percentage of the population in the Boston area follow even the ACC or at all. I mean, it's, I just don't think it, this, the college sports thing really would make that big of a difference. I remember a few years back that Boston College, where you are, had this terrific football team, and it was almost a non-story locally, whereas, like you said, if you were in SEC country, it would have been very different. Another uh, discrepancy between the two bills that I want to mention, which is actually a specific example of this attentiveness on the Senate's part to the potential problems associated with sports betting, is that the Senate wouldn't allow people to place bets using a credit card and the House would, which gets, to, uh, gets back to that bigger point. So, Shira, given the stealth passage of the Senate's bill, and given the differences between the two pieces of legislation that we've just been talking about, do you expect a compromise by the time this legislative session is done or not? I think it's likely, but not certain. The reason I think it's likely is that they did pass this with three months left of the legislative session. So that gives them a fair amount of time to really negotiate and iron out some of the differences. And I also think there is some pressure because Governor Baker wants it, the House wants it, polling shows the public wants it, the casinos want it, and the sports league want it. So there's a lot of reason to get it done. I think the real question is just given that there is fairly tepid support in the Senate, and there are some of these very significant differences, and it's not clear which of the differences the Senate put in as you know, really lined in the sand versus negotiating tactics. Right. Um, I think it's a big question whether they will actually be able to get it done in time. Father McGowan, at this point, now that the Senate debate has occurred and the bill's passed in the unusual manner that we've talked about here, what's your take on whether the House and Senate will reach an agreement and send a bill to the governor? I think I agree with Shira. I think they'll... <laughs> I think that the speaker made the big thing about the about, about uh, college sports betting, so that he could compromise on that. But I have a feeling he'll then want, use that ship to say, "I want you to, I want credit card and more of expanded online gambling." Because to be quite blunt, when you all the research I've done and looking at various states in New Jersey, they tripled the amount of money they took in on sports gambling when they went online. That's where, if you don't have sports betting online, you're not going to bring any revenue in. So now, again, I think the House is much more concerned about revenue, it seems, than the Senate. But maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that too. But I think that's where the compromises will be coming. Somehow, uh, the Senate will 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 win on the college sports betting, but they'll lose on the online betting and well, the credit card. Online. We'll see. Shira, tell me if I've got this right. My recollection from trying to pour through these pieces of legislation is that both the House and Senate allow some mobile gambling uh, or sports betting with services like DraftKings, for example, which is based here in Boston, but that the House opens up that market to operators in a way that the Senate does not. Is that an accurate characterization? And by all means, correct me if I'm getting it wrong. No, I think it is. And I think what's interesting is when we had first started this discussion years ago, there was a lot of talk about, well, do we want to allow sports betting on mobile or do we just want to allow it at physical sites like casinos and racetracks? And it seems like while there may be some differences, there is real consensus now that mobile is just an absolute must have. And that's that's really included in both the House and the Senate bills. Uh, Father McGowan, as you mentioned a moment ago, you study this stuff in, in different states across the country. Are there any flawed assumptions, either in the pieces of legislation that are up there at Beacon Hill right now, or that have been built into other states when they legalize sports betting that are worth highlighting? Things that you know people think it's going to work a certain way and it just doesn't work that way, or they think there's going to be a benefit that they just don't get? Well, I, in, in general, probably, I would say, and this is <laughs> the thing with legislators in general, they overestimate how much revenue is going to be involved. And, and then they try to base some programs on that. On that, I guess, what, and I need to read the, the legislation a little more clearly. I'd also like to know what percentage of the revenue is going to be used for problem gambling. That varies from state to state. And, and it's interesting in New Jersey, which was the first state in the, nor in the Northeast, as you mentioned in that Supreme Court case, they now use 5% of the revenue for, for problem gambling. Um, and we'll, we'll see, I mean, that to me would be what they, how 
how health, how is the state going to deal with that issue? Because it is clearly going to be going up when you have online gambling, sports gambling. The problem gambling goes up significantly. You mentioned to me earlier this week that that you imagine abuse of sports betting, particularly at some college campuses, right? That was an area that you said keep an eye on? Yes. I, w I mean, so one of the things that hits me there is up to now, most colleges, in fact, I don't know, one a dozen, is, is proud of the fact that they do not block out any sites on their own internet access. I have to admit, if I was a college president, I think I'd wonder about whether or not I try to block some of the sports more gambling things. But I, again, I, that would be very interesting because then you would just send students off campus to do it if they wanted to. Right, right. Yeah, but that's a, a fascinating question, I think, to ponder. Shira, uh, when I think about the way this debate has played out and contrast it to the discussion around legalizing casino gambling that occurred about a decade ago, I'm struck at how different this is than that was. You know, back then it was almost seen as this existential struggle. There were people speaking out strongly against legalization uh, on Beacon Hill, including former House Speaker Sal DeMacy, who's probably the most prominent one. This has been very muted in comparison. Why do you think that is? I think there's no question that this is much less of a big deal. And I think part of it is we have the casinos already. Right. We've seen them operating. They haven't caused a lot of problems. So it's pretty difficult to moralize against sports betting when you're already allowing so many other types of betting at the casinos. I also think Massachusetts is late to the game. I mean, as you know, there are already more than 30 states that allow sports betting without a lot of real problems. So I think people have seen that it's working, it's happening elsewhere. You know, people can drive across the border to Rhode Island or to New Hampshire and place a bet or to one of the states where it's legal. Um, I think we've seen some polling that shows there's a poll in the summer of 2021 that shows 61% of the public supports it. So I think now the discussion is much more coming down to how do you do it, not if you do it. Father McGowan, do you agree? Is that why this has oh, yeah. been understated? Oh, yeah. And the other thing that does strike me, I just did a, uh, I started out in the gambling business with lotteries. It took, by the way, it took over 30 years for 32 states to legalize lotteries. It oh, took exactly it took exactly two years to have 33 states legalize sports gambling. So clearly, I've nicknamed it the ethics of tolerance. Basically, you should allow somebody to do whatever they want as long as you don't hurt somebody else. Boom. All right. Father Richard McGowan, Shira Schoenberg, thank you both. That thank you. is going to do it for tonight, but do come back next week. And please, as always, tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics, or you can find me on Twitter at Riley Adam. For now, thank you for watching and good night.